Bibles, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy 19, ambitious Sunday. We're going to cover the entire chapter all at once. Again, don't get used to this because you know I don't normally do this, but this time it really does work. It does mean that we're going to have to kind of go, we're going to have to lean into it pretty good to get all of this because there's three big topics inside of the chapter, but it is a beautifully powerful chapter. And most of these things are things we have talked about numerous times, and the reason we're going to address them all at once is we have laid down that foundation for the three general topics that are in it. But when you see how they all connect together, and especially when you see how each one of these three point directly to the Savior, beautifully, wonderfully, there's no way that we could attack it and not try to get all of it all at once. So Deuteronomy chapter 19, I'm going to just read 1 to verse 21. And we'll see where the Lord takes us today. So, starting in verse 1, Moses still talking to Israel. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your God gives you, and you dispossess them and settle in their cities and in their houses, you shall set aside three cities for yourself in the midst of your land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. You shall prepare the roads for yourself. And divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God will give you as a possession, so that the manslayer may flee there. Now this is the case of the manslayer who may flee there and live. When he kills his friend unintentionally, not hating him previously, as when a man goes into the forest with his friend to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down the tree, and the iron head slips off the handle and strikes his friend so that he dies. He may flee to one of these cities and live. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue the manslayer in the heat of his anger and overtake him because the way is long and take his life, though he was not deserving of death since he had not hated him previously. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall set aside three cities for yourself. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory, just as he has sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land which he promised to give to your fathers, if, that's a condition word, if, You carefully observe all this commandment which I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways always. Then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides these three. So innocent blood will not be shed in the midst of your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance and blood guiltiness be be on you. But if there is a man who hates his neighbor, and lies in wait for him, and rises up against him, and strikes him, so that he dies, and he flees to one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there, and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood, that he may die. You shall not pity him, but you shall purge the blood of the innocent from Israel, that it may go well with you. You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark, which the ancestors have set, in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that the Lord your God gives you to possess. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid, and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Thus you shall not show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. When you left home this morning, did it occur to you that you might not be able to go back? When was the last time you felt the fear of not having a place to belong, a place to run to, a place to hide, a place to be accepted, to to be safe, to belong? How easy it is when we feel safe to forget that we have such an essential need, but God doesn't forget. The Lord knows that we have this need, not just desire, and certainly we do desire, but I'm talking about need. We have this need. God understands this, and we see Jesus address this need with the disciples as he spoke with them in the upper room. In John chapter 13, after he had washed their feet, he tells the disciples that 
I'll only be with you a little while longer, but I'm going somewhere, somewhere where right now you cannot go. Peter hears this and he struggles with it. He asks Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Why can't I go with you right now? Now, we often give Peter a hard time for not knowing when to be quiet. This isn't one of those times. We should praise God for the courage of Peter to speak up right now. Because the heart of Peter is real. real. The, uh, the fear of abandonment just leaps off of the page when we see what it is that he's saying. We can see the turmoil that's going on in his chart. And it is this fear that Jesus declares the beautiful promise to in John 14 when he says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in the Father, believe also in me. Trust my heart for you. That if I leave your immediate presence in the way that you have grown accustomed to, the only reason I would ever do this is because I'm preparing a place for you to belong. And if I prepare a place for you, that necessitates that I will come back. And I will take you to where I am. I will receive you to myself that where, where I am, there you Maybe also. It is this same heart to give us a place to belong that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 19. As God tells Israel yet again about the cities of refuge, we we have studied this previously. But he says these are cities of refuge that you are to establish in the promised land. And as I've discussed, we've already discussed this even in Deuteronomy, but also in other books as well. We talked about it extensively in Numbers chapter 35. And the reason that this is repeated so extensively in the law, and each time it pops up, it's not kind of a just, and this thing happened. God takes the time to go, and this is why, and so this person can flee, and this is what they're going to be saved from. And the reasons why he goes into it like this is because he knows the people will need this when they go into the promised land. You see, in the Middle East, there is a strong sense of tribal culture. Not just there, they're not the only ones, but especially there. It's one of the reasons why Western attempts to create countries with artificial borders never works. Tribal history knows no borders. And in those areas, tribal law was kept by the tribe. Blood demands blood. And if you killed a member of our family, our family's responsibility was to see justice done. We see a similar idea in the very last verse of chapter 19 here. Eye for eye, life for life, tooth for tooth. And God tells Israel that they were required as a nation to punish the guilty for their sin, no exceptions. But God also knew the anger that accompanies unfortunate circumstances. That the loss of someone that you love creates an overwhelming sense of pain and negative emotion. And like energy, emotion follows the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is neither created, nor is it destroyed. It is merely transferred from one object to the next. And within the tribal culture, there would be a desire to try to release all of that emotion by inflicting violence and harm to the one held responsible, regardless of circumstance, regardless of fault, that somehow if I can just inflict enough pain that I can numb out what's going on inside of me. And God understands this. It doesn't solve the issue. It would not heal the pain. So in place of raw tribal justice, God says, I want you to establish six cities of refuge. If the person caused, who caused the death of another then that person was allowed to run to the nearest city of refuge, and they were going to be safe there from the avenger of blood while the investigation was going on. And we talked about the avenger of blood in other studies as well. It was the representative of the family of the deceased, usually the oldest male within the family that was physically able to carry out the charge. And they were charged with carrying out the justice for the family, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But the avenger of blood was not permitted to go into the city of refuge. They were not permitted to harm the one who fled as long as they were inside the city, whether they were guilty or not. This is why if they are found guilty, the elders of the city of the guy who ran, because it's a personal problem, it's our city's problem, we go to the cities of refuge and we eject the person out, and outside of the city of refuge is where justice can be done. Well, as long as he was in there, he was safe. 
And what this did was give the city leaders and the local judges time. The time that was needed to conduct a proper, thorough investigation so that the actual facts of the incident could be made known. If it turned out that the person who fled was guilty of murder, if the death was the result of anger and hate, then the manslayer, the person who fled, was to be ejected from the city. That guy's own elders would travel to the city of refuge, and they would bring the person out, and they would hand them over to the avenger of blood, and the avenger of blood would strike the murderer dead. But if the death was an accident, then the avenger of blood was not permitted to harm the manslayer. The person was innocent of intentionally harming the one who had died. The loss is still tragic. Nothing changes that. But to allow the avenger of blood to kill the manslayer as though he was a murderer would have been to spill new innocent blood upon the land. Now, we already know all of that. We have studied it in depth in other passages. We've covered it extensively. But the reason why this appears here is because God is building on to that because he's going to give us an additional detail we have not seen before. And that's what we see in verse 3. That not only was Israel to designate the cities of refuge, but they were to locate these cities throughout the land so the city of refuge would always be nearby. They wouldn't all be in the north or all in the south. They wouldn't all be by the Jordan or all the way over by the sea. I want you to spread them out. Divide the land into thirds. And each area, each region would have a city of refuge. And not only that, I want you to build roads to the cities. I want you to make it as easy as possible for the manslayer to run and flee there. If not, they might be overtaken. They would be too weary to make the trip. Now, the idea of mercy and grace is overwhelming in these details. Not only does the Lord give the manslayer a place to run to, he facilitates the way for us to get there. Because mercy is worthless if there's no way to reach it. God doesn't sit in heaven and tell us to get up there. And if you can get to heaven, if you can be good enough, then I'll show you mercy. But in the fullness of time, God sent his son so that we might have eternal life in him. In verse 7, Moses references the three cities on the eastern side of the Jordan River. These were already established uh, on that side. But Moses tells him that if the Lord gives you what he promises to give you on the other side of the Jordan, remember they're on the eastern shore, they're getting ready for the, the crossing over to the western side, and he goes, if the Lord does what he promises to do and gives you the land over there, then you're going to need to set up cities of refuge on that side as well. And the reason for this is very practical, because they already have three on the eastern side. But the land on the eastern side of the Jordan and the land on the western side of the Jordan were separated, wait for it, by the Jordan. Now, this may not seem such a big deal to us, but just a bridge, you build a bridge, go over it. What's the big deal? But during this time of Israel's history, the Jordan was prone to not just flooding, but extreme flooding. We'll see this in Joshua chapter 3, that during the entire time of the harvest, there would be so much rain in the mountains north of Israel that it would flow down the Jordan, and it wouldn't just flood the blank, it would overflow the banks. There would be no way to cross over it. And because of this flooded condition, the Jordan River would have been this impossible barrier to pass. So in that moment, when they cross over, God performs a supernatural miracle. He causes the Jordan River to stand up on one side. But this was not to be a regular occurrence. It only happens two more times in Israel's history. So what was the manslayer to do if a terrible accident occurred during the time of the floods, when they were on the wrong side of the Jordan River? In order to remedy this, Moses tells the people that if God does what he promises to do and he gives you the promised land, then designate on that side of the Jordan three more cities. Three on the west side, three on the east. And you need to build road to those cities too so that everyone in Israel will have a chance to experience the mercy of God. However, don't get the message twisted. You're not permitted to be weak on crime. Evil is still evil. Sin was still sin. And just to make sure that they get this, God tells Israel through Moses that if a man who intentionally struck down his neighbor and his neighbor died, then you're to put that one to death. For not carrying out justice on the guilty was just as bad as punishing the one 
who didn't mean any harm. Now here we see how well God knows us. For God follows that command to carry out justice with the command of verse 14. No matter what you do, do not move the boundary stone. Now, first glance, this almost appears to be unrelated to everything around it. Cities of refuge, legal witnesses, what is this boundary stone in the middle? I mean, this is property law. We're talking about other law. But by now, we should know it is never the case that it just happens to be in the passage. Verse 14 is essential because what it does is it ties what came before it to what came after it. And while it does many things all at once, the first thing that it de declares is how well God knows us because he knows how often we will be tempted to compromise the truth of God. In this room, it is easy to be confident about the truth of God's word. It's easy to be zealous, to be strong with people who agree with you. But the struggle starts when dissenting voices begin. When that happens, there's that temptation to be quiet. We will be tempted to compromise. We'll, we'll still say the truth. We'll just make it a little less harsh. We will start to move the boundary stone. And the Lord says, don't. Do not call unholy what I have made clean, and do not endorse what I have condemned. Now understand who this warning is to. It's written in Deuter Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the book of Acts. It's not written to the world. God expects the world to compromise the truth. It's not that they're excused from the woe of Isaiah chapter 5. It definitely applies to them. But understand this, each time that he writes this, he's talking to us. He's talking to the people of God. The Lord of all creation looks directly at those who claim that they are his, and he tells them, his people, do not move the boundary stone. Do not call holy what I have condemned. Do not call unholy what I have made clean. Well, that all seems clear. But then God makes sure that we understand the lesson, and starting in verse 15, he conveys to the hearer that it's not enough to hold fast to the truth of God in our hearts. I want you to put that belief into action. In verse 15, the Lord tells Israel that you will not take just one person's word on what happened, but every legal fact must be established by two or three witnesses. Now, not only is this an essential a component of a man-regulated criminal justice system that may have a potential murder case, but let's be honest, it's just good advice. Proverbs 18 tells us that the first person to show up and start speaking, they sound right. Until the other party shows up and they start to cross-examine the first person who was speaking, they start poking holes in their version of the story. Therefore, every legal fact must be determined by two or more witnesses so the judges have the best opportunity to render righteous judgment in the land. Verse 16 continues this idea of the witnesses, but combines it with the exhortation of not moving the boundary stone in verse 14. And the Lord tells Israel through Moses, don't be a false witness. Don't lie about what it is that you know. Because if you do, you will receive the consequence that you tried to do to the one you accused. This was not just an exhortation, to be honest. It declares the necessity of an honest witness to the righteous heart of a nation. There's a reason why it's one of the Ten Commandments. And by adding consequence to the expectation that people should be honest about what they say would help, would help protect all of Israel against the weaponization of the government against the people they were supposed to protect. Again, the Lord knows us. He knows the deceit of our hearts. For in our flesh, we all have wicked hearts that will pretend to follow the rules, while at the same time corrupting what we swear we are trying to uphold. We see this vividly in 1 Kings chapter 21 with King Ahab, the wicked king of the northern kingdom when he's pitching a fit because he wanted to buy a particular vineyard, and the owner of that vineyard was mean, and he wouldn't sell it to me. He goes home, and he's all sulking. 
like the spoiled little kid that he was, and his, his wife, Jezebel, the wicked queen, is just disgusted with him. Aren't you supposed to be the king? You know what? I'm here. I'll take care of it. What Jezebel does is she writes letters in the king's name, and she arranges for what 1 Kings chapter 21 calls worthless men. And she says, go and and bring Naboth to a feast. And while he's sitting there, put him in the place of honor and have these worthless men accuse him of blasphemy, blasphemy, knowing that the punishment for such a crime for the offender was to be stoned to death. Now, the punishment for such evil is clear. We see it here in Deuteronomy 19, that she should receive whatever it is that she was trying to do. So should these worthless men. But she's the queen. Surely no one in the nation of Israel would dare raise a hand and punish her. But the Lord is not mocked. That which a man reaps, he will sow. The Lord knew what Jezebel had done and what Ahab had turned a blind eye to. Therefore, he sends a prophet he knows will declare the word of the Lord. He sends Elijah to Ahab. When Elijah shows up, Ahab is playing in his brand new vineyard. He's all excited. Ahab shows up, and, or excuse me, Elijah shows up, and part of what he tells Ahab is this, Jezebel will be killed for her wickedness, and the dogs will eat her body in the street. The ultimate insult in the land. And it's exactly what we see happen in 2 Kings chapter 9. When we see that, we're like, what is this? Seems a little bit extreme, doesn't it? But what this is, is necessary. It must happen if justice and righteousness are to be protected in the land. What this is is what God declares here in Deuteronomy 19. If a malicious witness raises up and they accuse the innocent of doing what is wrong and you find out what has happened, you are not to spare the wicked. They were to receive whatever punishment they tried to inflict on the one who was accused. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Do not show pity. And by doing what the Lord has commanded, Israel would purge the evil from the land. seems so harsh, so unlike the mercy of the beginning of the chapter, a city of refuge where the one who's been accused could run to. Where's the mercy at the end of the chapter? It's still there. But you see this idea of malicious witness points us to another trial. When the innocent was accused by the wicked, Near the end of the Gospels, we read as Jesus will go through a series of religious uh, trials by the religious elite, by King Herod and by Pilate. In Mark 14, we see the secret nighttime trial conducted by the religious elite. Now, even they have to pretend they're playing by the rules, so they search for witnesses, and we're told that they bring in numerous witnesses who would accuse Jesus of doing something wrong, but Mark tells us that many came forward giving false testimony, but they couldn't agree on what they were saying. And even those pretending to play by the rules knew that, come on, you at least have to have testimonies that are consistent with one another. Because of this, Deuteronomy 19 should apply. These false witnesses should receive the punishment that they were trying to put on our Lord. These these wicked judges should have the same thing put on them. So why weren't they punished? Why weren't they put, put to death? And the reason why they were not is because Jesus took their place. They deserve judgment. But Jesus received that judgment for them. It's the one thing we haven't mentioned today regarding the cities of refuge. Just because the manslayer was found innocent of murder, they didn't mean that they got off scot-free. Blood had still been shed. A life was still lost. So what happened was that the manslayer was released from the hands of the avenger of blood and they were now confined to the city of refuge. They couldn't go for a walk in the countryside. They couldn't go home. They had to stay in that one place until one thing happened, until the death of the high priest who was in office at that time. The death of the high priest would act as the substitutionary sacrifice for the death of the manslayer. And with the death of the high priest, the manslayer could finally go home. When you left home this morning, 
did it occur to you that you might not get to go back? That's how we started today. And the heart of the question is still the same. But the point of this chapter goes beyond the idea of laws and witnesses. The idea is bigger than a city or a pile of stones. The point of the entire passage is that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We are the guilty and we need somewhere to run. But who would give shelter to the sinner? Who would tell the sinner to come back home? Our Father would. But the standard of God is an immovable boundary. He can't save us by moving the stone and still be the holy and righteous judge that we need. So we sent his son. When we most deserve to be judged, the king of glory stepped down from his throne. And when we were too weary to reach the city of refuge, the city of refuge reached down to us. And because he is our city of refuge, Jesus is our savior, he is our safety, and he is our home. Father, we love you. We are unworthy to even read the words on this page, much less declare them out loud. And yet you have charged us with the responsibility to, to declare to those who are still in darkness that a way exists. You can still go home. Father, we don't deserve for there to be a way. We don't deserve to, there, there to be somewhere for us to run. And yet you have made all things possible. All the promises of God are yes and amen. But only in Jesus. Only in the Christ. So we who are guilty cry out to you. For those who know you, who have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, we rejoice. The King has made us clean. The King allows us to go home. But Father, there are those who still don't know how good it is to be loved by Jesus. They don't know that their sins can be washed away. So, Father, this is the message that we get to give to those who are still in darkness, for those who would seek to attack us, that everything in us would try to withhold the truth from them. But you have saved here, do not be a malicious witness. Do not, do not lie what it is that you know. Just tell them the truth. Tell them about me. And when you do so, you, res you remove the blood guilt from your lives. So, Father, encouragement and safety, but exhortation and charge. Now we are all responsible for what it is you have written here. So, Father, give us opportunities to tell us, to tell other people about the one that we love. Lord, we love you. We sit here today in awe of you. No one else deserves to be, pra be praised but you. So, Father, forgive the frailty of your servant. We are so unworthy to declare your name, but we get to. Mighty God, we get to. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Family, we will have one.